Houston with Tomas Demand to talk about the retrospective of his work, Tomas Demand, The Stutter of History. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. The MFA Houston is the only U.S. venue for this show. Can you tell me why uh, you and the organizers decided now was the time for a retrospective and how you have organized the works? Well, the first work in the show is, I think it's from 1998 or something like that. So I'm, it's around 30-something uh, years I'm doing this. And uh, we thought it would be a good moment to have a bigger overview of you know, how things developed and how they branched out in different directions. And, um, and when we came up with this idea, the resonance was actually quite uh, interestingly coming from all over the place, but Germany. So, you know, the show has opened in Shanghai and then went to Paris and Israel and now it's going to Taiwan. So that was quite encouraging and uh, quite surprising to me too. And then there was interest from Houston, which was very, uh, very nice. And, um, and now we're here. And so is it roughly chronological, the way the show is laid out, or is it grouped by themes, or a little of both? Or? It's, uh, it's both. It's kind of, it follows roughly the chronology of the work, but it has thematic sections. Mm -hmm. So the one we were sitting in here is, for instance, is a little bit like a sidestep of the work, which is called dailies, and it's little photographs I first took on an iPhone and then recreated um, for the camera. and. Um, but there is, it's about the personal history in you know, the German context where I come from. It starts with and then it kind of widens to more uh, global iconography. Um, then a more uh, pastoral uh, set of images. Um, and then you know, things which more related to art history at the end of the show. So it's kind of four or five sections. Mm -hmm. But it follows a chronology. So one of the earliest works in the exhibition is Archive from, I think, 1995. Can you tell me what interested you about that scene? I started making sculptures as a student and I, you know, I was a painter and I thought I sculptures, I would rather do sculptures than paintings and I started and I didn't want to spend much money. And I thought I make them of paper because I can discard it easily. I can redo them if, if somebody actually is interested. And I made these things and then, you know, I did discard them for a while and uh, at some point I just realized maybe I make a photograph before I throw them away. Um, so to have a record of what I'm actually doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, rec the photographs were so lousy because I wasn't, they never studied photography or did, you know, an, an, an apprenticeship. Um, that I, I, a whole new set of problems came up which I had to muscle, which was trying to represent my, the beauty of what I thought the sculpture has into a two-dimensional representation, a picture, a photograph. Uh, so my things are life-size, usually. I mean, 99% are life-size sculptures, and the archive is one where um, I looked into the repetition of the same object. You know, it's like we know this from Campbell's soup boxes, like, you know, the consumerism likes the same object, full, full, full shelves and stuff, but with a twist. And I came across this photograph of an archive with these film boxes by Lini Riefenstahl. She did a film which was forbidden, and she didn't, of course, she didn't want to throw all the copies away, so she, ba she stored them in her basement. And that is, a, that is the photograph I found in a book. Um, and I like the film boxes because they're very specific, not unlike files. Archives usually have files, and files are really, you know, boring. Um, but this one could be a pizza box, it could be a, you know, like it's, it has a couple of possible readings, which is it's not so one-dimensional. And then it has this ladder, which kind of, you know, opens the space to the, to, to the top where the light comes from. So it's a very simple picture, but it has a lot of different possibilities to be read. And that's why I liked it so much. You mentioned that one of the sections of the show uh, focuses on art historical influences. Well, one of those works fascinated me, uh, which is Pond from 2020. I see the reference to Monet's Water Lilies, but I was actually very interested in how you thought about positioning the spectator relative to the scene, because you kind of have to be floating in mid-air mid to see it the way you see it. Mm. Uh, there's different ways you place people, the viewer, in, in your works. How do you think through that process as you're framing and cropping? I, most of the space, uh, spaces I do are indoor spaces. Mm -hmm. So if I do outdoors, very often I do nature, because that's somehow something we know very, very intrinsically, and we intuitively we know what a good green is, and we know how a forest would look like. And um, the indoors perspective are always like you stand in front of a window 
into that space, but you stand in there because everything is untouched and no, there's no human figures there, so it looks like you're a little bit kind of an intruder or like a ghost in the room and you just could actually touch everything, but at the same time you know nothing is there anymore of what you look at. Um, if I do nature outside, it has a more, um, not pedestrian, but like a passerby view, you know, mm -hmm. like you would walk by in a park and in the, in the pond version, it's of course, it's a, it's a pun on Monet, you know, but then Monet would have built, Monet is interesting not only because it's so beautiful, but also because he built the nature for his paintings, you know, he made the garden mm -hmm. just to be painted. It's mm -hmm. not like that he walked into, you know, the forest and then found a pond or something. He had a whole garden made just for the paintings. And so my, of course, that's very much up my alley because I construct the world for the camera and not, I don't walk around with the camera and find the right spot or something. But in Monet's garden, there are these bridges from which he painted and he would have always like this elevated view onto the pond from these bridges. And that's the viewpoint I'm looking for. You mentioned uh, earlier that after you build these models and photograph them, you destroy them. Is there something significant about the process of destruction or is it simply, I gotta get this out of here? There's two fears. One of them is the, is the, is the fear of the blank page. Mm -hmm. A writer knows very well. Uh, but the opposite fear is like, you have too much stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's why I have to get rid of stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't have, the, I need space. You know, mm -hmm. I need an open space to start thinking of something. And if I would keep these things, I have to care for them because they fall apart. Mm -hmm. Also, like, it just, it needs to be an empty desk. Mm -hmm. And then you can start a new project. Clean slate. That's why I do it. But I usually do, I, I'm usually too late. It takes me much longer than I think. So I'm usually too late and then uh, I have to catch a plane and I have two guys who come in. They don't, my, they don't give you know, much about my work and they <laughs> dump it and when I come back it's gone. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, sometimes it's a little uh, sad if you have to do it yourself. Well, I was going to ask if there was any kind of ritual that you went through. No. Uh, but basically the ritual is calling these no, two guys. No, but what it is, yeah. of, you know, there is it's, a, it's hitting a good point because if you stand in one of those things when they're really finished, mm -hmm. you know, like a room, imagine you work for two months in something like the control room and then you stand there and it's finished and everything is artificial, but you are not. You know, there is something really weird happening about you yourself feeling like, a, like the idea of yourself rather than the real, you know, Thomas Demand or whatever. And if you have to kind of uh, throw this down, you also kind of dumping uh, uh, your own lifetime, in a sense, you spend on this. And so that's why I leave it to other people. But m mind you, the, everything I do is life size. Everything I do is what you see is paper. There's no hidden construction of like steel and wood or something like that. This is all easy to throw away, but also it's easy to recycle. And it's kind of, you know, I'm not leaving like a, a disaster, a natural disaster behind me. It's just, it goes into the paper container and then it becomes a newspaper probably, which prints a nice picture, which I can then use again. Um, control room and also tribute, which is a really stunningly beautiful uh, picture, both make me wonder how you handle the question of lighting. So how much of the lighting is studio lighting exterior to the construction? And, or is, is there any even that is interior to the construction? How do you create those scenes so that they are so vibrantly lit? So control room is, that, for me, the, 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 the starting point for control room was, there's Fukushima, there's a meltdown, nobody can go, we don't know what happens. Like Chernobyl was bad enough, but this one seemed to be bigger. Uh, there is a heroic team of 50 engineers going from Tokyo to Fukushima, the opposite side. Everybody tries to escape and very orderly because they're Japanese and you see the, the, the highway, it's all stuck and very slowly moving and then the other the, is completely empty and that's the way they took and most of them actually had, uh, developed cancer afterwards so they really took risk their life. Mm -hmm. And they come into this control room and there's nothing wrong, I mean there's nothing broken, it's just like the ceiling came down and no, nothing is on the dials. And they send photographs from with their cell phone to their dears and, it, and you know, it gets leaked and it gets out. The, the company which ran it wanted to suppress that. They didn't like that very much, this kind of uh, imagery. Um, but this is the photograph which actually really f taken by a somehow hero, you know, in, I think in Japanese culture you can say that without a subtone. Um, and you see the ceiling coming down. So if you turn this around, the whole picture in your mind, you would have these kind of shapes coming up like this, you know, and 
it looks a little bit like a Caspar David Friedrich painting, mm -hmm. which is called the, the the Broken Hope or something. It's a ship called Hope, and mm -hmm. it's in in ice, mm -hmm. and it's it's a it's a iconic image from the Romantic movement about like the you know the inability of the human of the human culture to kind of actually beat nature, and that makes sense if you look at the nuclear plant, you know, but it's completely my interpretation. It's not like that they did it like that. If you turn the picture around again, it comes from the top. There's God, you know, the, the light coming f and it's kind of like thunder coming into that, into that, the hybris of, of Bill, you know, trying to kind of get endless sources of, uh, of power without paying a price for that. Mm -hmm. I like that very much about that picture, that it has all this without showing much of this, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, of ruin and rubble. A tribute in a very uh, roundabout way includes images of people, but pretty much all, all of your work is completely unpopulated. But there's evidence, obviously, that people have been or are about to come into the space. Mm -hmm. And I think about Refuge 2 uh, from 2021, where it's a scene that's on the verge of being populated. It's a bed that someone will lay in. Um, why is that duality of absence and presence so important in your work? It, that's very well described. The, you know, there is a pl there is plenty of people with photograph people to start with, you know, and so I don't have to do that because it's taken care of. But the, the difference is probably if you if you imagine a photograph of a let's say a library, and we have like on the side we have a, an old style library, nineteenth century library or something, and we have a big window on the side which you don't see, but the light kind of comes in and the air is really dusty and you see the books in the big bookshelves and behind. That would be one picture. The same picture now, two girls sitting in the, in the sunlight, studying together a book. The picture would be about those two girls studying the book, whereas the other picture is about what is a library? You know, what is, what is, what is the promise of a library? Is it, a, is, it a, is it an inspirational context? Is it an old-fashioned way of uh, storing knowledge? Or, you know, like all these kind of things come up. And of course, I'm more interested in the circumstances, in the situation, in the context of a space, and how much a space can speak. You know, like you see some, you see a pen on a desk. You, you don't need many things. You know, like a pen on a desk, maybe a half half cup of coffee and an ashtray, and that tells a story. And I'm I'm after the metaphorical qualities of these stories, indicated by objects. That's what I'm looking for. And if I have people in there, then if at all as a silhouette or as a shadow or something, but never, it, once, once my hand would be in or some person would sit in there, it would be always about this person. And my, in general, my pictures try to kind of, somehow, if that's even possible, but they try to kind of um, take off the anecdotal part of a story and look at the more um, metaphorical mm -hmm. element. Mm -hmm. Or others said, like, you know, the daily picture, is one thing we kind of register as like, oh, that happened today. But I think there are pictures which kind of come back to us all the time, like tribute, for instance, or like a, you know, a ruin or some incident, something, you know, destroyed or destruction or like, you know, like a beautiful idea of a grotto. Is it, these are, I wouldn't say eternal pictures because that was a bit, would be a bit full mouth, but like the, they are pictures which we as human beings kind of carry us with with us, and they and then we recognize them when we get when we get there, mm -hmm. and you know and they, we keep coming back to them, and so that's the pictures I'm after, not the anecdote, the more like the Uber mm -hmm. picture if mm -hmm. that's existing, the meta, the meta picture, yeah. I can know yeah. that's exactly the word. Wow, well, it's an amazing show and uh, really is uh, very, very nicely installed. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk thank to us. Thank you very much for the interest. Thank you. Yeah. Find all of our videos and sign up for our newsletter at artthisweek.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter.